God's method of saving sinners through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, the method is by delivering the message of the gospel. People come to saving faith, I'll say it this way, people come to saving faith in Jesus when they hear the gospel proclaimed and the Spirit enlivens their heart and they respond to that gospel message in faith. But it starts with this discipline we're talking tonight about evangelism. It starts with evangelism. And so I want to jump into the outline quickly, and tonight we're going to do something a little different uh, than we've done in past weeks. So let me pray for us, and then we want to, want to jump right in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this beautiful text of Scripture. I thank you for... Um, I thank you for this beautiful reminder all the way from the prophet Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, tonight I pray you would remind us of how significant this discipline is for the Christian life, not just for our growth in godliness, but for others' growth in godliness. And Lord, I pray that you would use tonight's discussion um, as fuel, uh, Lord, that would empower us to go and share and witness and proclaim, herald the message of the gospel. So come encourage our hearts tonight to do that. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hopefully you have an outline. If you're in the room, you hopefully grab one when you came in. If you're watching this on video, you just a reminder, you can check in the description box below the video, and there will be a link to the PDF, a PDF copy of the outline for tonight. So I encourage you to go there and pull that outline up so you can follow along with us. All right, so I'm going to try my best to get through this outline pretty quickly, and we're going to spend a good amount of time toward the end of our session tonight. Uh, I want to spend showing you some really practical ways you can share your faith. All right, now, I'll put a disclaimer out here. Pastor Rob right now has been teaching a whole semester-long class on evangelism, and there is a lot we could learn and a lot we could say about evangelism. That's why we devote a whole semester to it. And if you've, if you've not taken that, I would encourage you either to take it next time it's offered or you can go online to the YouTube page and all of those classes are logged there, right? And so there's a lot of things we could discuss in the world of evangelism. So this is a 10,000-foot view tonight, okay? So here we go, right on the outline. What we're going to see is this idea of the discipline of evangelism. I want to think about this in terms of three characteristics. And as we look at these characteristics, we want to remember that godliness, our growth in godliness requires us to evangelize. And not just our own growth, but as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, others' growth in godliness requires that we evangelize, right? Uh, how will they come to saving faith in Christ unless someone is sent to preach the good news? All right, so three characteristics of this, this idea of evangelism. Number one, number one, evangelism is expected. Now, some of these are going to sound familiar. These headings are similar from chapter to chapter, okay? Number one, evangelism is expected. I put this quote on your outline from page 120 in the book. Dr. Whitney says this, quote, Evangelism is presenting Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to sinful people in order that they may come to put their trust in God through him to receive Jesus as their Savior, and to serve him as their king in the fellowship of his church. <clears throat> now, that's the author's definition of evangelism. It's a good one. Um, it's pretty thorough, right? Now, if you had to summarize that, you might say that a little differently, right, than all of, all of those phrases we just read. Here's how I summarized it, letter B. What's a concise way of defining evangelism? Well, evangelism is, is simply to be faithfully communicating the gospel. 
faithfully communicating the gospel. And uh, let, let me pause for just a minute. Someone tell me, when we use the word gospel, what are we talking about? God's word, good news. Let's be, be real specific. What is this gospel? The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus? Yeah? Well, let me... I, I, I can't remember if I mentioned this in this class, or I think it might have been a different one. Um, my favorite Christmas movie is a Charlie Brown Christmas. Okay? I love Charlie Brown. love the Christmas movie. And if you've seen the Christmas movie, you know that um, Linus stands up in the middle of the movie, and he, just, he basically just recites from Luke chapter 2. Fear not, for behold, I bring you, if you know the KJV, it's what? Glad tidings of great joy. Uh, if you're reading like the ESV or a modern translation, it probably says, I bring you good news of great joy. The root word used in Luke 2 for I bring you good news, is the word uh, evangelion, which is where we get the word gospel. So we could, we could actually say it that way, behold, I bring you the gospel. The gospel is, uh, it's not a nebulous idea, it's a message, right? It's a message of good news. We're going to look more at that message later. But when it comes to evangelism, you know, sometimes I think... I think some people don't prioritize evangelizing because they get scared about what it is, what they have to do. They, they feel like they don't know what the right thing to do is or the right thing to say is. Listen, evangelism at the heart, very simply put, is being faithful to communicate the gospel. That's it. If you faithfully communicate the gospel, then you are effectively evangelizing, right? Right? We'll, we'll look a little more at that later. Um, there, and there are different methods of doing this, right? Different methods when, which we can kind of package and share that message of the gospel. But the message remains the same, and our job is to faithfully communicate that gospel message. Letter C. I want to show you in the Bible why I believe this to be true. Uh, I listed five or six scriptures there. Let me just point out a couple, Okay. Uh, for the sake of time tonight. First, and maybe the, the, the most obvious that might come to your mind, is from Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28 is the great commission that Jesus gives his church. And what, what some of you know this verse, right? Uh, Go therefore, and what? And make disciples. That's right. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Right? This is what the church is to be all about doing, making disciples for Jesus Christ. Right? So, so the Lord gives us this commission. He commands us to make disciples. And, and listen, let me point out something about that verse. The command is not simply to make converts to Christ. That's part of the command. The command is to go and make disciples, which involves evangelizing, right? Bringing people to Christ by proclaiming the gospel and calling them to put their faith in the Lord Jesus. It also involves teaching them to observe all the things the Lord Jesus commanded, right? So it, it involves evangelism, and it involves discipleship after evangelism. Tonight we're kind of talking about this, the beginning part of making disciples, uh, which is what Jesus commanded the church. One more scripture here, Acts 1.8. You know this scripture, you see it on the screen. In Acts 1.8, um, when the early church begins uh, in the book of Acts, it's, it's founded and grounded in, in this particular verse. Okay, Acts 1, 8, we talk about this in a different class. It is a thematic verse for the whole book of Acts, this, this particular verse. It says this, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. There it is. In Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
And as you read the book of Acts, you, you see the church growing and witnessing in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. All right, so, so here we have a scripture that reminds us the life of the early church was built around evangelism. Last scripture, 1 Peter 2.9. This is one of my favorites. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? That you may proclaim. Don't, isn't, isn't that a great text? Why have we been redeemed, friends, that we might proclaim? It's why the Lord has saved us. That's why he's put us where we are on this planet, that we might proclaim the greatness of the one who called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. So you, you see here in 1 Peter 2, we, we're saved to be witnesses, right? And there are many other verses we could look at. Evangelism is at the heart of the Bible, it's at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Christ. In fact, uh, I heard one, one uh, pastor say this years ago. He said, if you call yourself a disciple, but you're actually not active in making disciples, I simply don't know what you mean when you call yourself a disciple. You'll get that later. That's a lot of, a lot of disciples in that one statement, right? To be a disciple is to evangelize. To grow in godliness is to grow in this discipline of evangelism. And you might be thinking, oh, wait a minute. I know there are verses in the Bible that talk about how God gave the church evangelists. Maybe you, you, you've read a, a text like Ephesians chapter 4. And to the church, he, yeah, he was talking about the gifting. That's right. Uh, he gave some to be teachers uh, or evangelists. And maybe you've read that verse in Ephesians 4 and you think, well, Evangelism is just for those who are gifted in, uh, as evangelists, right? Those vocational, those who are called to be evangelists. No, 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 no. When you read the whole counsel of Scripture, these verses I've, I've just shown you and many others, um, it becomes crystal clear that all Christians are to evangelize. Uh, every believer. Not everyone is called to be a vocational evangelist, right? Right? So you think of, I mean, think of great evangelists like a Billy Graham, right, who devoted his life to, as a vocational evangelist, much like not everyone is called to be a vocational missionary or a vocational pastor. That's okay. But all of us have been saved, again, 1 Peter chapter 2, that we might proclaim, right? We're called to evangelize. I like how Charles Spurgeon puts this. You've probably picked up on the fact that I really like quotes from older men and women of the faith. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, quote, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. What a great statement. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. To be a believer is to evangelize. So that's number one. Evangelism is expected. It's clear in the Bible. It is an expected thing that we are to do. Number two, Try to stay with me. I'm trying to move pretty quick through the outline. Number two, evangelism is empowered. Evangelism is empowered. Um, this is a tremendous truth that I, I, I would encourage you to think more deeply on than the five or ten minutes we can talk about it tonight. Because when you, if you really believe this, what we're going to see in the Scripture that evangelism is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, that it's going to put wind in your sails to go evangelize. All right? Uh, Dr. Whitney says this on page 125. You see it on the outline, letter A. Quote, The Holy Spirit not only empowers people who share the gospel, but the gospel we share is itself embedded with the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is, this is really, really helpful, okay? So what he's saying is the Holy Spirit gives us the desire to witness to others. It gives us the boldness to witness to others, right? He empowers us to do it. But the Spirit inspires the message that we share, 
right? We're sharing the word of Christ, the holy inspired words of Scripture with others, right? We, we don't, in, other, in other words, we don't have to come up with some clever thing to say. That's not what the Lord's called us to do. Uh, it, 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 it's the, the Spirit-inspired message. So look at letter B. I want to show you where I see this in the Bible. A couple of scriptures here. You've, you've probably heard Romans 1.16. You've heard this verse, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Pause real quick. The gospel, again, this is not a nebulous idea. The gospel's what? A message. It is something we proclaim. I'm not ashamed of that message we proclaim of good news, right? For, why am I not ashamed? It is the power. Not we, not the messenger, that message is the power of God unto salvation. you got to let that sink in, right? The heart of what we're doing when we evangelize is we are... We're, we're messenger boys and girls, right? We're just delivering a message, and in that message is God's power to open a heart to, right, to where they have spiritual sight. Uh, it's like, uh, so I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and in Louisville, um, uh, <laughs> we're not known for many really great things, I guess, uh, you know, bourbon, bluegrass, I mean, there's some things there. But one of the one of the big things Louisville, Kentucky is known for is the Kentucky Derby. Okay, so I've grown up my whole life uh, watching the Derby. The, the church where I served in Louisville was just a few blocks away from Churchill Downs, where they run the Derby, and it's fascinating when you when you see horses. There are times where they'll put these blinders on the horse. You know what I'm talking about, right? They put them. Why do Why do they put blinders on a horse? They're not distracted, right? They're just, they, they only see like what's right in front of them. What happens when we evangelize is that we deliver this message, right? The gospel message and the power of the Holy Spirit working in the recipient of that message removes the spiritual blinders off their eyes, right? All they were seeing is this world and their life and living for their way until the Spirit removes that blinder, and now they have spiritual sight. They see spiritual reality. They're aware of spiritual things that they weren't before. And, and this is what happens as, as we evangelize. Uh, you know, we take that message, which is the power of God to salvation, Romans 1.16. Second scripture. We read this as we came in, Romans 10.17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word of Christ. Uh, there's a, a very well-meaning old dead saint who a lot of years ago said, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. You've heard this saying, right? Here's the thing. It is necessary to use words. Faith. Now, his point is, model the gospel in your life, okay? I know what he was saying. But the reality is, in order for the gospel to be received, it, it's to be heard, okay? It's to be delivered so it can be received by someone, right? So it's not something we simply just model in life. No, this is a message we proclaim, and faith comes by hearing that message. Make sense? This is, this is the method God has designed. Um, uh, I heard years ago a pastor liken this to the U.S. Postal Service. Stay with me, okay? The U.S. Postal Service. You know what the U.S. Postal Service's goal is? Well, supposed to be. Yeah. Their goal, <laughs> yeah, is uh, the, the way they measure success is by the careful and accurate delivery of the message. Right? That's exactly right. If If my sister out in St. Louis, mails me a letter. The Postal Service has been successful when it shows up where? In my mailbox, right? Careful and accurate delivery to where it needs to go, okay? Um, as Christians, here's the thing. This is, this is analogous to what we're called to do. 
We're, we're simply to faithfully deliver the message. That's it. We, we don't have to, to you know, come up, conjure up some clever, persuasive thing uh, that's some other message. No, we just deliver God's message. And if we are faithful to deliver God's message, guess what? We've been successful at evangelizing. And this is, boy, this is really freeing because it doesn't ultimately matter how the person responds in in this sense. Our successfulness in delivering the gospel isn't based on their response, right? We've been successful if we faithfully deliver the message, right? Right? That letter just needs to show up in the mailbox. Right? We just want to deliver the message, and when we do it, we've faithfully done what God has called us to do. This is, the, this is the idea behind evangelism. And I just want to point out one more time, this is freeing because, again, we're not called to craft our own message. We're not. We don't even have, listen, we don't have to be creative. <laughs> we don't have to be eloquent. We don't have to be ultimately all that persuasive. We have to be faithful. We have to be faithful. And, and, and the, the, I think the thing that helps motivate faithfulness is knowing that evangelism is empowered. It's empowered. That as we go and we faithfully seek to deliver that message God's given us, His Spirit is going to empower us to do it, and His Spirit is going to have the power to work in the recipient's heart to hear it and receive it and believe it. That makes sense? So evangelism, number one, is not only expected, but number two, evangelism is empowered. The Holy Spirit is empowering us and the message that we have to share. Number three, evangelism is a discipline. Evangelism is a discipline. Now, let me... I want to point out something the author said in the book because I think this is really helpful for me. Uh, In John, excuse me, letter A on your outline says, this is a quote from the book, page 127, evangelism is a natural overflow of the Christian life. And he, he cites John chapter 9, verse 25. Do you know what happens in the gospel of John in chapter 9? Does anyone know what John 9 is all about? You got it? Yes, that's where he, the man born blind, that's exactly right. Um, uh, it, at the beginning of John 9, I'm just going to read it to you. Jesus passes by, he sees a man blind from birth. You remember this story? And the disciples ask Jesus, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that this guy was born blind? And what does Jesus say? It wasn't that this man sinned or that his parents sinned, but why? First, that's exactly right, in verse 3, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, that God's purpose might be seen in his life. Well, you get all the way down to verse 25 in that story, and I'll, I'll put this on the screen so you can see it, okay? This is, if you, on the screen you see John nine twenty-five, okay? He answered, this is the blind man. Okay, so the people are saying, you know, how did you get healed? What happened? Who did this? The blind man answered, and he said, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I do know, though I was blind, now I see. The point the author's making is there is a sense in which evangelism is a natural overflow of our life. How easy is it to tell someone what God has done for you, right? I was once blind, now I see. God did that in me, right? Part of my testimony is to be able to tell someone, April 10th of 1991, I was sitting in a church service listening to Brother Don Coleman preach uh, the Sunday morning sermon, and in that sermon, God used Brother Coleman to preach the gospel, and he opened my ears so I would hear it, and he changed my heart so I would believe it. And that day, I remember thinking, I need Jesus, (laughs) right? 
God did that in me. I was once blind, but now I see, right? Just like this man in John 9. All of us who are believers, you have stories. Maybe not just like mine, but you have a story of what God's done for you. Well, there's a sense in which evangelism involves being able to say, look, God did something in my life, right? Okay? Every Christian, he goes on to say on the outline, every Christian should be able to talk about what the Lord has done for him or or her and what he means to him or her. That's easy. We can do that. But evangelism is also a discipline in that we must discipline ourselves to get in situations where evangelism can occur. We must discipline ourselves to get in situations where evangelism can occur. In other words, we can't just sit around waiting for evangelism opportunities to happen. I mean, life experience tells us, you know that, that that's simply the, the case, right? Uh, many years ago, there was a restaurant in uh, my hometown called Tivana. Starbucks bought Tivana and, um, and kind of it went by the wayside, but there used to be this restaurant, Tivana. You'd go get a hot cup of tea. They had 99 flavors of tea on the wall, and it was wonderful. I love hot tea, so I'd go all the, often to get tea. And I came into Tivana one, at one point, I had my Bible with me. I was going to, you know, had it under my arm, I was going to get a cup of tea and take my Bible and sit down and read. Well, I ordered my tea, and uh, I set my Bible on the counter, went to pay, and the lady behind the counter, her name was Grace. She was, uh, she was Chinese, and uh, she saw that on the front of my Bible it said, Reverend Dale Fields. And so she was making my tea, and she said, can I ask you a question? Sure, yeah. Are you a pastor? You know, she like, I said. Yes, ma'am. How'd you know? I mean, then I thought, oh, I've got my Bible, you know. And, of course, she said, well, it says right there on your Bible, you know, Reverend Dale Fields. And, uh, and uh, so struck up a conversation and, and learned that, that she had just moved from China. She was studying, this is a real thing, by the way, theology. To be a theologist, uh, she was working on her, this, you can look this up, a master's of theology. That's a real thing. She was studying to get a master's degree in theology or what, you know, some field there. And she had come to China to learn about how Americans perceive teas and different things. And so we struck up a whole conversation. And I said, um, I said, well, you asked me about my Bible. I was just curious, uh, are you a spiritual person? And she said, my whole family are Buddhists. Well, that's interesting. You know, they're family from different places in Asia and how that came into her family. She shared the whole story. And I got back to the church that night. I was serving at a church. Got back to the church, and I was telling someone that I got an opportunity to have a gospel conversation today with this, this girl at the tea shop. And they said, oh, I bet you do that a lot. And I said, well, you know, it's funny. Being a pastor, I, know, I normally am around believers in the church. I have to really work to go out to a situation where I'm around lost people. Friends, you know that to be true. I know know many of you pretty well in the room. I mean, most of us, we're really good at gathering here and doing things inside the walls of the church. Evangelism is a discipline because if we don't intentionally put ourselves in situations where evangelism can occur, it won't happen. We won't do it. We'll get through the end of another day and think, oh, yeah, missed that opportunity. Didn't didn't do it right, um, and so this is what the author is talking about. Okay, uh, we're putting ourselves in places where we can evangelize. The discipline of getting in those situations. Letter B. He also points out that one reason we don't witness is a simple lack of disciplining ourselves to do it. He says, apart from making it a discipline, most Christians will seldom share the gospel. You believe that to be true? I believe that to be true. I know I've experienced that in my own life. When I have not disciplined myself to go and share the gospel, I don't do it. I was telling somebody that, plus I'm an introvert. Man, I love to sit by myself with my Bible and do Bible studies. I'm good at that, right? I mean, i got to work to go out and evangelize. So let me ask, 
why is it that it's so difficult to go do this? Somebody tell me, why do you think it's so hard for some of us to go evangelize? It's not easy to talk to strangers. That's right. In our culture, you know, that's hostile to the gospel. You, I mean, right, there's, there's some, the majority of people you talk with, sometimes we're afraid. Boy, that's true. Thank you for saying that, being honest about that. I've been there. There are times where I think, yeah, if I say this, they're going to hate me, right? Hey, hey, you ever, you ever felt that way about witnessing to a family member? Oh, that's like a whole other level of being timid, right? Maybe being fearful. Because, like, that's one thing to witness to a stranger that you're, you may not ever see again. But to your uncle that you see five times a year you know, or, or whatever, right? Man, they're going to hate me. They don't like the Lord. They don't like that religious stuff, you know. Right. A relative can be the hardest conversation of all. There are lots of, lots of reasons we don't share the gospel. Uh, let me give you a few. This is not from your book, okay? And I want to give you these, but I want to encourage you, as I give you these five things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the, uh, the antidote, if you will, for solving this, this particular issue, this barrier to sharing your faith, okay? Okay. Um, so this, this comes from Tim, Dr. Tim Booker, the book uh, Invitation to, to Witness or Invitation to Evangelism, I guess it is. That's the book Pastor Rob is teaching through, okay? And in that book, see, you didn't know for coming here, you actually get both classes in one, right? In that book, uh, he talks about common barriers to sharing our faith. Here's five. Number one, there's the barrier, Bill, you said this, the barrier of fear, the barrier of fear. I mean, maybe you've thought this. I, I'm just, it's not that I don't know the gospel message. I'm just afraid. I'm afraid to go talk to somebody, whether it's family or a stranger or a neighbor or whoever. And I would just encourage you, if that's you, one way to kind of overcome that is start by identifying what are you really afraid of? What is it that you're really afraid of in sharing? Identify that fear. Oftentimes, we just fear, feel uh, fearful, and we don't, really don't know why, right? Identify what is it that you're afraid of, and then start working to combat that fear. Number two, the barrier of ignorance. Uh, the barrier of ignorance. Maybe you said this. Maybe you feel this way tonight. I don't know how to witness. You know, I've, I, I'm not afraid to go talk to people, but I just I don't know what to say. I'm afraid I'm going to say it wrong. What if I say the wrong thing? Then they believe the wrong thing. That'd be bad, you know, right? Hey, listen, we chuckle, but, you know, that's a reality. This is what it is. Um, Here's the thing. Here's the antidote for that. Learn the message and get a method. It's that simple. Learn the gospel message. Find a method to share it. I'm going to help you with that in just a minute, okay? Number three, the barrier of apathy. Maybe you lack the desire to witness. And if that's you, I would would encourage you, read through your New Testament and study scriptures on how Jesus had compassion for the lost. Remind yourself daily that to be like Jesus, we need to have a heart like he had that was compassionate to lost people, right? Uh, I mean, you think... Just scriptures that come to mind, like Matthew 9, where Jesus is found sitting with tax collectors and sinners, and his disciples, are they don't don't get it. What are you doing? They're the lost people. Mark 10, Jesus says, I didn't come, right, for the saved. I came to seek and save the lost, right? Compassion for the lost. Number four, the barrier of introspection. Maybe you're a fairly new believer and you think something like, man, I just got to get my act in order before I can go tell someone else the gospel. Let me encourage you, if that's you, if you think I'm just not a good enough Christian, 
to share the gospel, let me remind you of your role <laughs> in the sharing of the gospel. You got to listen, this is important. You've got to distinguish between God's role in bringing people to Christ and your role. What's your role? You're the messenger. That's it. We our role is to be faithful, right? To get the letter from point A to point B. Faithful messengers of the gospel. Number 5, the barrier of busyness. How much how, how common is this one? The barrier of busyness. I can't find the time to witness. Just can't find the time. Let me remind you, if that's you, remember we always make time for what matters most. All of us do. And if you're struggling finding the time, I would encourage you to remind yourself daily, whether it's something you write out, you put scripture up, you just put a statement in front of you, that what what matters most, what's most important is people because people are what's eternal. The souls of people will last forever. Everything else is coming down. All of it will fade away. But the souls of people will last forever. That's what's eternal, right? We find the time. Number four, application questions. Okay, so before we get to these resources, just a couple of questions that I would encourage you to think through, okay? Letter A. So you need to know what are the main elements of the gospel message. What, you know, we, we talk about this word all the time. Uh, we're going to go preach the gospel, share the gospel. We believe the gospel. We stand on the gospel. We sing about the gospel. Okay, well, we talked earlier, it's a message. It's the message of good news. Okay, but what's involved? What are the components of that message? And I'm going to summarize it by this. I'll show you a resource in just a minute that you can, where you can learn more about this, okay? When I teach people how to share the gospel, I tell them, you've got you to remember four words. If you get four words, then you've got the whole message. God, man, Christ, and response. Those four words summarize the gospel message. God, man, Christ, response. And I would say it, would share, share that message, something like this. God is our loving creator who made all things good. Man came into the world and didn't follow God's good design, did they? No. Man rebelled against God, and sin entered the world, which separates us from our good God. But, number three, God has a solution to our sin problem through his son, Jesus Christ. He sent Jesus to be a sacrifice for our sins so that if we for respond, we put our faith and trust in Jesus, we will be saved. We have the hope of eternal life. It involves at least those four things. God, man, Christ, response. Does that make sense? And there are lots of ways we can talk about those four things. That's why you have all these different like types of evangelism classes and strategies. But at the core, the gospel message involves God the creator, man the sinner, Jesus the Savior, and our need to respond in faith and repentance. You, that's it. You got to get those four things. That's letter A. Letter B. Maybe you've never tried to do this. I had a seminary professor years ago, and he said, I want you to summarize the gospel in one to two sentences. I was like, oh. Well, I've never thought about doing that before. I, In fact, the church where I grew up was um, the church that pioneered, helped pioneer the faith evangelism training. I don't, some of you have been around the church. You may know this where you memorize the gospel message by the uh, the acronym FAITH, F-A-I-T-H. And it's this whole system that you you memorize, and then you go out and share based on this system of a gospel presentation. Well, I was thinking, well, what? that's like a 15-minute presentation. He wants me to say this in a sentence or two? How do I do that, you know? Listen, there are plenty of opportunities you're going to have in life. Like, I don't know, say you're at a tea shop and you're talking to a Buddhist. This is real life, you know, or you don't have 15 or 30 minutes, but you might have 60 seconds. I would, would, I've done this personally. I've actually done it multiple times and I get my, I tweak mine all the time. I would encourage you to go home and write it out. 
no more than two, maybe three sentences. But a couple of sentences, if you write it and write it and write it and read it and memorize it, you'll have that ready to go, right? To where you can easily communicate what is the gospel. Letter C, what method will you use for evangelism? And letter D, what is one way you will commit to intentional evangelism this week? All right, so I encourage you to think through those four questions. I want to spend the rest of our time showing you some practical ways you can evangelize, okay? So I've given you three of these on the outline, and I think these are really good. Uh, letter A, under these resources. i got to go quick because my time, I feel like my time always runs out so fast. Um, letter A, uh, uh, a gentleman who's now pastoring in my hometown, ironically, his name is Greg Gilbert. A lot of years ago, he wrote a book. This is not the book. This is the little gospel pamphlet. But he wrote a book. The cover looks just like that. Actually, I think I can put it up here. There we go. It's on the screen. He wrote this book called What is the Gospel? And you know what the chapter titles are in this book? God, man, Christ, and response. You got it. Actually, I think there might be one or two more, but those four I think are in there. Um, if you want to think more about the gospel message as, you know, as it answers this question you see on the title of the book, what is the gospel? It's a great book. It's probably 100 pages long, maybe. It's, it's short, very readable. Um, and, and in that book, he, he kind of teases out what, you know, these, these four main ideas behind the gospel, God, man, Christ, and our response. Okay, so if, you, if you've never shared the gospel, or maybe you're fuzzy on what it is, okay, I would highly encourage you to read that book. It's a great little book. Uh, letter B. So the last two are, are some methods by which you can share the gospel. Here's letter B, this little, this little book called Two Ways to Live. Two Ways to Live. This is my absolute favorite method of sharing the gospel. This is, uh, this is typically what I use when I, when I share the gospel with people. If I've got a few minutes to talk to someone, this is the method I use. I'm going to show you why I like it, okay? So I keep a little book like this in my Bible. You can get these. They're like 50 cents a piece or something, okay? If you just go online, two ways to live. I think there's an app on the phone where you don't even have to have a little booklet. I'm not, I like books, so I'm, I'm kind of an oddball in our technological age, okay? But um, two ways to live, the subtitle is The Choice We All Face. And what he does in Two Ways to Live is he walks through six scriptures you memorize six Bible verses and a statement that explains each verse, okay? So I'm going to show these to you real fast. If you can jot these down, you, I mean, you don't even have to buy the book. I'll just show them to you. You can jot these verses down and go home and memorize them. Memorize the verse, memorize the statement, craft your own. This will give you a pretty good picture of the, of the biblical gospel. Here they are. All right, just go through them on the screen. So um, number one. It says, God is the loving ruler of the world. He made the world, and all the world is under his rule. Okay? The verse for that is Revelation 4.11. I think I mentioned this a while back. This is the verse I, I use when I share the gospel. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive honor and glory, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and existed. In other words, God is worthy of all of our worship because he's the creator, right? Number two. We don't follow God's good design for creation, right? This is, this is the, the problem of mankind. We reject God's rule in our lives. You can say it a number of ways. We reject our loving ruler trying to run our lives our own way, apart from God. And the scripture, you can, I don't know if you can see it's kind of small. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. There is no one who's righteous, right? No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. No, not one. We've all rejected our loving creator. Number three, but God won't let us rebel forever. The truth of the matter is there's coming a day where we're going to stand before the Lord. He's not going to let us rebel forever. Hebrews chapter 9 says man is destined to die once and then face judgment. Hebrews 9.27. Hebrews 9.27. Sorry. Hebrews 9.27, man is destined to die, and then we face the judgment. 
Number four. But because of his great love, God sent his son Jesus to provide a solution for our problem of sin, for our rebellion. And the scripture here is 1 Peter, I think it's 3.18. It's hard to see, isn't it? Christ died, 1 Peter 3.18, Christ died once, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. 1 Peter 3.18. God sent Jesus as a solution to our problem of sin. Number five. Number five. God raised Jesus up from the dead to be the ruler of the world. He's conquered death. And now he gives new life, and one day will come to judge the living and the dead. The verse there is 1 Peter 1, verse 3. In his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 3. And the last slide, number 6. In light of numbers 1 through 5, all of us have a choice to make. There are two ways we can live, hence the name of the book, right? There are two ways we can live. We can either reject God as the ruler, run our lives our own way, or we can submit to Jesus as our ruler and rely on Jesus' death and resurrection for forgiveness in God's sight, right? Two ways to live. And then you present that choice, right? I mean, that's a great telling of the gospel message. Six, uh, oh, the scripture, I didn't tell you the scripture. This is simply from John chapter 3, not John 3.16, even though that's a good one. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has what? Eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Now, I, love, I, I like this little presentation because I think it is thoroughly biblical. I think it... I think it really explains the God, man, Christ response well. Does that make sense? So if you can, I mean, this is six Bible verses. Commit those to memory or put them on a note card, keep it in your Bible, your purse, your wallet. That's easy. Six Bible verses. You can remember those, right? And just explain each one. I mean, I, you can probably do it. I've never, never timed it, but you could probably do it in three or four minutes, you know? So that's one. Uh, last last thing, and I'll we'll wrap up here in three or four minutes. Um, the uh, the last method we call oh this is two ways to live. I'm sorry. If you were to download the app or you go online, this is the little picture. They actually encourage. I've never done it this way, but both this method and the next one encourages you to draw this on a napkin. If you're ever at a restaurant with somebody, just to draw it. Um, I don't. I'm not a very good artist, visual artist, so I don't really draw a lot. But um, they, you know, they say sometimes it can be easy just for folks to see the six images, right? I think memorizing those six verses is really helpful. Here's the last last thing. Oh, oh, one more thing. Two ways to live has the same thing in a kids format called "Who Would Be King," which is awesome. So if you ever have the opportunity to share with a child or a grandchild the gospel. You can go online and download this free, I think. Who would be king? It's just the same thing, just using terms and lingo that children would understand better, right? Who's going to be the king of your heart? Is it King Jesus, or are you going to be the king of your heart, right? Two ways to live. Last thing, the three circles. This is the third method. Uh, this is the method Pastor Rob likes. Okay, so I like two ways to live the best. He, he really likes three circles. Uh, my wife, who is a director at a local pregnancy center, uh, this is the method they use. They've adopted at the pregnancy center to share the gospel. Some of you support that pregnancy center. You know what I'm talking about. Um, because in this, in this model, and I'm out, I don't have a lot of time to explain the whole thing, but, but you probably can figure out, if you look at those three circles on the screen, you begin by talking about God's design, right? How God created all things good, and you, you see... That arrow, you, you draw an arrow and say, well, sin has entered the world, and that leads to what? Brokenness. Here's the thing. Here's what I like about this. I love the term brokenness because everybody, everybody can relate to brokenness, right? Uh, in fact, when I, I've used this before, 
Um, my wife and I were talking through this a couple of years ago, like how she should use this with clients that come into the pregnancy center. And um, the arrows that come out of brokenness is where you might say something to someone like, well, God created the world good, but sin came into the world, and that sin always leads to brokenness. Do you think the world's like it should be? Nobody's going to say yes. Right? Everybody knows what brokenness is. And you might give those arrows are examples, if you will, of, of brokenness. And I mean, there's lots of those things. I'm, I'm not going to um, uh, go through all of that. But, you, you know, you can think through examples of brokenness in our world. And then you say, well, God's provided a solution for the brokenness in our world, which is the gospel. Right? And the gospel calls us, you can see those words, to repent and believe. And once we do that, we start to recover and pursue God's good design. So that's the, I'll put this up here. This is really hard to see. There's scriptures that go along with that as well. Um, but if you look this up online, you can download this. These are all online, Two Ways to Live and the Three Circles. Here's why I show you these, okay? The core of the gospel message is what? Four words, God, man, Christ, response. There are lots of ways you can package that to help you remember. There are lots of ways we package that depending on what context we're in, right? In a few weeks, I'm going to go speak at a preschool chapel. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use a, you know, all the language in that two ways to live presentation. No, I'm going to use very simple words and phrases for five-year-olds, you know? That's okay. We, we package it differently, but those four elements, God, man, Christ, response, are the heart of the gospel message. And so I would encourage you to adopt a method. I honestly think that's the biggest reason people don't share the gospel is they just, they're not really sure what to say. And sometimes it's out of a really good heart of, I don't want to get it wrong, right? Well, I'm showing you, this is how you get it right, okay? You adopt a method that highlights those four things, God the creator, man the sinner, Jesus the savior, and the call to respond in faith and repentance, right? That's at the heart of the gospel. Let me, let me pause. Uh, we've got two minutes. Is that helpful? Not helpful? Kind of helpful? Okay, good. Uh, by the way, if you show up at the church office, we have both of these resources. I know the church office has the three circles booklets. I have stacks of the um, two ways to live booklets in my office. The, and by the way, Greg Gilbert, the what is the gospel? That's why I brought this. I forgot to tell you. This is just a little gospel track, you know, a little brochure. It says, God, man, Jesus Christ, our response, you know. Just a little, you know, I keep in my Bible. You just never know when, when someone, when you'll have an opportunity for a gospel conversation, and you can hand it to someone, right? So I highly recommend that first resource, these little gospel, gospel tracts as well. Any questions on those? Anything I can clear up before we wrap up? I hope those are helpful to you. Let me encourage you to adopt a method. And be sure, last thing, be sure that the method you adopt is rooted in the Scripture. Right? We're, we're, not, we're not trying to create our own message. We're, we're delivering this one. Right? We're, we're, just, we're passing along the Word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of Christ. So why I like those methods is it shows you what scripture to, to read or memorize and quote, right? Find a method that's rooted in the scripture that faithfully articulates the gospel. All right, we're out of time. <laughs> so let me pray for us, and we'll wrap up. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the great reminder of the importance of evangelism in our Christian walk um, in our desire to grow in godliness. And Lord, I pray this week that, that you would keep this reminder on our hearts that we would be eager to evangelize. Help us be intentional to get in situations um, around unbelievers. Or we will be intentional to have opportunities to interact with unbelievers having gospel conversations Lord, help us be intentional to formulate the gospel message in our own minds so that we know what to say when we are in those situations. And Lord, I pray all of this for the advance of the kingdom of Christ. 
Lord, you would use us to be faithful witnesses for Christ as we go through the rest of our week. In Jesus' name we, we ask and pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. We'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Right? Have a great week. We'll see you next Wednesday.